Thanks so much for joining everyone. We're glad you're here. I'm Janelle DeRobertis. I'm one of the customer success managers here at Swivel. I'm really excited to be here with all of you um, and learn from Jonathan today as we continue our series. We're about halfway through, so we've had we've been learning a lot over the past few weeks and we've got plenty more to come. And they're all being recorded. You're able to watch them back, so that's super exciting. Um, before I introduce Jonathan, I just want to share a little bit of background about why we're hosting this series. Um, in the ever-evolving education landscape, adaptability is something that we think is a really important skill for all of us to have. Um, we are firmly planted in the age of AI, where technology is completely reshaping the way that we teach and learn. So as we recognize this um, and how this transformation is taking place, we want to introduce the Swivel Adaptability Initiative. So what we're doing is we're working with schools and districts um, from all over to build learning communities that can transform innovative ideas into actual strategies. So we want to equip educators with all the skills that they need, particularly adaptability um, and what we're doing to support that is, I'm super excited, we're offering an adaptability initiative grant. And we have, um, we're gonna drop the link in the chat to schedule a quick call to learn more about how you can apply for that grant. The deadline is November 10th. Um, so really hope you um, take some time to learn about that and apply. Another piece of our initiative is our collaboration with thought leaders like Jonathan. Um, joining us from Australia. We are so excited to have Jonathan share his insights and expertise with everyone. And I also want to quickly let you know if you this is your first webinar, um, you're able to get a professional development certificate for attendance. So if you're attending live or if you're watching the recording back, you can um, request the certificate. So um, to demonstrate your commitment to and our commitment to supporting your ongoing growth and development. And um, after this webinar, what we'll do, be doing is demonstrating our reflectivity software to show how it is a powerful ally on your educational journey and how that really supports the idea of, of being adaptable. So now to introduce Jonathan um, Nalder. He is also known as the Edgenaut. He has 23 years of experience in education and six years in space education. Jonathan has been at the cutting edge of learning how tools such as design thinking, STEM, AI, AR, VR, and environment sensors combine with future thinking to transform lives. Now, just as the fully digital and multi-planetary era begins, he has dedicated himself to helping students and teachers transition to this new era via programs like First on Mars and Space 2101. He is a globally awarded innovator, Chief Futures Officer at STEM Punk, Mars Society Ambassador, member of Crew 270 at the Mars Desert Research Station, founder of FutureWe.org, writer for Space Australia, ISTE online presenter, and a co-spaces ambassador. Jonathan, we welcome you and you are up. <laughs> Thanks so much, Janelle. Um, yeah, it's always a little weird sitting through the intro, but I really appreciate it. And um, just to follow up what you were sharing before, I know any any fellow teachers, educators watching, you know, the idea of, oh, I get a certificate. That's awesome. I'll, I'll take that um, is really important. And probably even more exciting is the idea of grants. Um, so, yeah, I look forward to hearing more about those as well. I'm sure uh, everybody will. Um, but yeah, again, thanks for the welcome. And uh, hi to everyone who's here. Uh, we had a few people reporting in now. Uh, Janelle said, yes, I'm coming to you from Australia, uh, Brisbane, actually, Queensland, if anyone's ever made it down this way. Um, but yeah, I see we had a, a few people. Um, I've uh, been to North Carolina myself, spent about a week there a few years ago. Um, and yeah, I see we've got uh, a few people from that similar time zone where it'll be afternoon um, for you guys, I'm guessing. So I hope you're, yeah, you know, you, this is a chance for you now to maybe put the tools down and uh, yeah, do, do a bit of self-learning uh, and relax a little bit. I mean, I have coffee, you guys might have something else uh, at this hour, but um, yeah, sit back and there will be a little bit, a little bit of interaction 
So just warning you about that ahead of time. And we're also happy if you have a question through the talk, if you want to, um, Janelle can probably let you know if that goes in the Q and A or the chat. Um, we can, um, you know, pause pause a couple of times if there's something about what we're what we're uh, talking about, or you might want to save yours for a Q and A at the end. All right. So yeah, without any further ado, I've got a bit of a story to tell, I guess, around AI, where it's where it's kind of coming from, and then wanting to re really get into that practical practical side of things. Oh, we got an iced coffee. Nice. <laughs> yeah, that that's perfect. <laughs> Alrighty, so I'm going to flip the share screen switch and you guys should be able to you just give me a little thumbs up. That little looks good to now. Yeah, excellent. Uh, all right, so we're talking about generative AI. I've heard GPT, generative AI. This is sort of the big phase of AI that we're at. And it is a chance for us to, I guess, regenerate our idea of what education can be. Um, but more specifically, I really want to focus in on uh, where does the sort of these new AI tools, where do they meet design thinking? Um, and as you can see, I'm from STEM punks, <laughs> that's who I get to work with. Um, so I'll be focusing in on the idea of STEM journeys and problem solving, uh, that that side of things um, as well. But yeah, I'm trying to zero in by the end of our talk on real practical, um, practical applications. Hi and welcome. I use generative AI to make a historical sketch version of myself come to life. And uh, if you could see the little me there talking, there's an example of generative AI where first I used one app to make a, it's actually like a note, like a dollar note type sketch version of, of myself from a selfie and then a different service called HeyGen that then makes it talk. But if you notice, you know, like the eyes are a bit funny. We're not quite there, not quite there yet in some of those tools, but still pretty incredible. And if probably if my selfie was better, if it was like face on rather than to the side, um, it would have worked a lot better. So anyway, we'll talk more about that. All right. So I've already done the intro about me, so we don't need to go into too much of this uh, anymore. Um, but, you know, I've always been fascinated by, okay, well, what's coming up next? Um, so me, yep, I'm definitely in that early adopter type category. Um, you can definitely stick me uh, in that box. But I guess I've learned a lot of lessons in my time, especially doing technology with other teachers. Um, I've learned a lot about, uh, actually, it's not about the technology. Uh, it's about what are we going to do with it and our learning goals. And I'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. Just wanted to give you an agenda. What are we going to try and cover? And I guess the next kind of 35 40 minutes or so before our Q&A. Uh, I'll talk about kind of where is where is education and technology been. We'll talk about the, the current state of things, especially with AI, and then we'll look at some examples of how to integrate these AI tools, specifically talking about design thinking. Uh, but if you know the SAMR model, S-A-M-R, I uh, will also talk about, um, I'll also throw that in there as well. But um, you can see my little image here about math teachers protesting against calculators. Um, and... Well, it's sort of back in the in the 60s and 70s, so before my particular time. Um, but it's fascinating. You know, I'm an ex-history teacher, um, and if you really go back and look at the history of um, especially new technologies coming into, into society, but specifically into schools, uh, there is just so many classics, and there's basically a cycle that repeats, um, you know, of new things coming along, and uh, yeah, protests or getting banned, uh, calculators, an example, something we never even think about too much these days. Uh, but my favorite one probably was at the time when um, we were doing away with fountain pens in schools. Um, so it was biros or lead pencils uh, were, were becoming more in use. Um, and apparently at that time there were protests that students were going to lose their skills of sharpening their fountain, their fountain pens. They were, because um, you know that was a really important skill that they would need later in life and if they didn't know how to sharpen and use them properly and you know that would be the end of education and every time I hear that story I'm just thinking wait all the students had sharp knives in their desks can you imagine that a classroom of that now um, and it just goes to show yeah, it's a weird wonderful journey that we're all on and this is just the current Current next stage, I guess. Um, yeah, so by the end of the webinar, this is one of what I want to be talking about, um, design thinking and where we can plug in a whole bunch of different um, AI tools, what some good ones that fit into those different stages. That's sort of where we're, we're going by the end. But as I said before, I learned a lot of lessons about actually not putting the technology first. 
And any of the, the tools that we talk about today, I would much rather that, um, you know, they might sound cool and you might be an early adopter like me, potentially, if you're in this webinar, you are, um, you might want to go, oh, I'm just going to go and try that. Um, and actually, that is completely fine. That's great. We need people who do that, test it out, try it out, so you can then report on what, you know, does it actually work or not for education? But on a larger scale, you know, getting our other colleagues involved and talking to school administration, um, rolling out new technologies. Yeah, I think it just works, only works from what I've seen if we have those learning goals clear first. So it could be some of the, these kind of goals. I mean, all schools will have their, their set purposes and learning goals on what you're trying to achieve. Obviously, there's curriculum goals, but you often have bigger goals like these as well, like how, you know, have every student become a creator, not a consumer, or help every student become an independent learner. And some of these might just be your, per what's your personal thing that you really love to see develop in students? And of course, if you keep this at the forefront of your mind, then you know you'll only choose the tools that are actually going to help achieve those those goals rather than look it's easily possible and I've done it to, to waste a lot of time playing around with tools that might you know they might be cool and shiny um, but if you have limited time like like me like most educators having that goal really clear um yeah will will make a, a lot of difference All right so a little bit of a recap about uh, where we've been and this partly comes from that history teacher side of me but also the work I've done uh, with future we uh, community and where we just wanted to map out or well, where does this stuff kind of fit and what's an easy way to communicate that um, so what we came up with from that work uh, with future we was okay there was a pre-industrial era and during that time if you lived then uh, most of the work that that was done was was phys generally physical uh, in some way only a very small um, part of the population was actually uh, literate in any way. And if we get up to sort of the 16, 1700s onwards in the Industrial Revolution, um, that was when humans came up with these machines that whether they were steam powered or later electricity could actually start to replace humans doing that that work, that physical stuff. So absolutely fascinating shift that happened where most of our labor or our work moved to being mental. You know, we start using our brains <laughs> um, rather than, you know, our physical labor to do our job whatever and obviously uh that's when mass education um first really evolved especially in western societies um and really largely and this is a little bit of a simplification but largely like if everyone's switching to mental labor we need that mass education we need uh, mass literacy and numeracy um, and that has made possible our, our whole modern world you know the fact that we can communicate across vast distances like this speak the same language uh, you know read etc with each other is because of um, that that shift, and that's really what mass education um, has given us. Um, schools, schools, etc. Just realised I have a typo in there. Anyway, <laughs> um, so that was that. But where we're at now is there's there's some different levels of uh, artificial intelligence or AI. That's what what we're here to talk about. So for a, for quite a while, we've had narrow AI, um, and that's an AI that you know, is really good at doing like one one little thing. So maybe that's making a playlist on your phone, or maybe that's just autocorrect. Um, just little, little automatic tools, um, you know, spell check, <laughs> kind of the original one in this category, just little narrow, and they just do one little job um, well, but they're not necessarily crossing over to doing multiple, you know, tools that are, are going to assist us. Uh, where we're at now, this gen generative um, sort of era in AI, uh, is is branching out across uh, multiple multiple things. Um, it's not what you, we would call artificial general intelligence. Um, it's still kind of restricted to um, those large language models. So there's a whole bunch of text and images, etc., that are being dumped in, um, and the, the tools research those, and then they'll generate. We'll talk more about what that generate process is, but it's not yet at that. Okay, now it's intelligent on its own, and it can work in, independently. Um, Right. Uh, also, where are we at? Well, no human has actually beaten a computer in a chess tournament for over 15 years, um, which, you know, might might feel like a little bit of a downer, like, oh, OK. Um, but actually, with the, if you look at the statistics of people playing and learning about chess, it's it's more popular than it's been in, in over 50 years. Um, so it's not doesn't I guess what I'm trying to say with this slide is it's not necessarily um, this downer um, that we're losing losing something there's a, there's a kind of a coexistence and it's a fascinating um, stage when you start looking at oh okay well that's happening but this is happening I mean, yeah 
Um, there's a few other things that happened even in just the last week, fairly fairly big things. So the US government itself um, has released their AI ethics guidelines. as quite, um, And that's something that, um, especially in the US and, and Western spheres, um, there's a lot of guidance in there now for uh, the AI tools as they move as they move forward and the kinds of things that they, they need to stick to. Um, we've had, you might have heard of Copilot that Microsoft is releasing, and that's a whole bunch of integrated AI tools rather than having to go just to a... AI website or an app, having them integrated inside uh, the, a lot of the Microsoft programs that many of us use all the time. They'll just they'll just be there. Um, another big change is ChatGPT, which was sort of kicked off about a year ago when they released ChatGPT as free um, tool to the public. Um, continually releasing new features, including now you can import a PDF and then interrogate it. You're basically the chat that you're doing is with the contents um, of the PDF itself. Um, and they've also added image analysis. And um, I've seen a lot of educators playing around with that. And it's to the point where you could upload, your, you know, your homework, for instance, a photo of your homework and get it to analyze that and answer it for you. But of course, there's that image analysis has a whole range of other um, type uses as well. So that was just some stuff from the last week. All right, let's think about the, the image generation. And this is just a, a, not a very long change between these two images. Uh, using the mid journey t journey tool um, and I guess what we're looking at and the, the first the older image there is more obvious about what's happening here is that uh, the AI tool is going and finding little bits and pieces of other images and then mashing them together to to make the new one uh, much harder to tell um, obviously by that that more recent recent one um, but this is a little interactive exercise uh, that I wanted everyone to do uh, which is if you've got yeah your computer obviously you, you do because you're watching but you know phone whatever if you go to this website which face is real.com and all you're going to need to do is just click on the person who is real you'll get one image which will be real and then you'll get another one which has been generated the moment you loaded the website um, using that generative technology mashing together bits of other images basically so we're going to take about two or three minutes um, i'll check the chat as well see what's been happening there um, We'll just see what kind of success rate you might end up with. Uh, here's the ones it loaded for me. And it's probably easier if you're on a bigger screen. It's going to be a little easier for you. Um, but it's not always like I'm looking at these two here. There's definitely the one uh, inside looks a lot, a lot more real. The one of the lady outside has got some clear little fudgy, fudgy bits. So I'm going to click on that one which will give me a wrong answer. <laughs> I played it the wrong way around. <laughs> I'm going to play again. And if you're playing at home, oh, this one's obvious as well. I can see on, you can see on the left-hand side, it's pretty, they've added in this other weird eye of a person. So I'm going to, oh, I've got that one. Play one more time. Now you might want to put your success rate in the chat. If you want to say that you got three out of five. Oh, now this one is quite a bit trickier, actually. So hopefully you've come across one like this as well. Um, the one on the right, the uh, man in glasses, is quite a sharp image and it almost looks too sharp. It looks a bit artificially generated. But the one on the left is really kind of soft and a bit blurry, and that's often a sign of it being um, generated as well. So this one, yeah, I'm really not too sure. I think I'll pick the... Soft one? Oh, there you go. All right, so that's sharpness, yeah. And look, um, if if many of us, we've probably gotten a lot better in the last 6, 12 months at picking this this kind of thing. And I have noticed um, using this example in in workshops, etc. people generally getting a bit better. Um, now, uh, oh, someone got three out of six. Oh, four out of six is actually really good. Um, oh, Janelle, you got five out of six. Yeah. Um, there was a time, um, maybe even a year or so ago, where... I would have expected most people would get most of them um, incorrect. So I think we were actually our, you know, ourselves, we've been getting better at this as generative AI has become more of a thing. Um, but the one thing I reveal at this point is this particular website, which I highly recommend take it and use it with your staff and colleagues. It's a great little discussion generator. Um, but this tool itself, this website is about four years old. <laughs> Um, so this is four-year-old technology. So maybe, you know, maybe we should have done better than than we did on on what we scored. Um, if you think, well, 
what's the technology, you know, how fast has that technology advanced from then uh, until now? Um, yeah, but as I said, use definitely, yeah, go ahead and use that. It's a great, um, great way to sort of start this discussion. Uh, all right, so we talked about pre-industrial and then the industrial era. And if that was the shift from physical to mental labor, um, the way I talk about, uh, I guess, the shift that we're at now, and I, I kind of see it as being um, um, just as big as if, you know, we've now got, machine, you know, by saying machines, AI computers that can replace a lot of our mental labor. That's kind of the shift that's happening. And so then that sort of begs the question of, well, what, <laughs> what you know, what a human is going to do. Now, there's definitely going to be collaborating. Um, it's not a replacement situation um, at all. Uh, but I guess this is the way I, I like to, to think and talk about it now in the sense that, uh, yeah, so machines, if they're replacing our human labor, but what does that give us? Well, I think it gives us room to be more human, actually, uh, to spend more time. Firstly, maybe more on rather than actually authoring on the editing side of things. That's just a, just one quick mindset way of thinking about it, um, moving to more that sort of collaborative um, type type model. Um, but there's also a, a chance, as I saying, to be more human with each other. And in education, for instance, if that means that AI can help do a lot of the grading, for instance, um, and free up <laughs> some teacher time, maybe that means we can actually sit down with students more and give that more personal feedback and, and support that we wouldn't have had time for because the basic grading um, has, has been taken care of. So that's kind of my, my hope anyway, where I'd love to see that that shift uh move to uh right yeah so i'm gonna sum it up with this this kind of sentiment that won't replace us but you know those who can work with the technology well obviously you know it's just a natural way of or yep have an have an advantage whether it's just personal satisfaction you feel like you're doing your job better surviving better uh etc um now generative ai so everyone would have heard the term chat gpt but what always surprised me is um, unless you go looking for it, well, what does the GPT bit actually mean? <laughs> um, it's not usually spelled out um, too much. So the GPT, just just to just to recap for everyone, that is the idea of yep, it's generative. So it's creating an on-demand response. Um, generally, your content doesn't exist until you type in the prompt and push push enter. Uh, then it will um, go and find mash together the bits of information required for it. So that's the generating part. Uh, the P pre-trained. Um, now, whatever it generates for you, yep, it's it's been pre-trained to do that process. Um, and these days, you know, they're up to billions and um, what they call tokens, um, or text examples or image examples that have been um, pre-trained on. And basic understanding is that the bigger those models get, um, the more accurate um, and and better they become uh yeah and then trans the idea of transformer the t is just yep it's taking that existing text and then re repurposing it um so you know the idea that it's artificial intelligence it doesn't have that independence at all it's still very much based in yep it's being pre-trained it's taking existing text or images um that's still very much the model it's not reaching that idea of uh, independent thinking but um, yeah, there's a lot of work obviously being done to move it forward to that. Um, some examples then, let's talk sort of specifically, and these are the ones you would know the best, are the, the GPT platforms like ChatGPT or Google has Bard. It's another good one called Claude. You type in your text, et cetera, and you'll get those answers back. Uh, chatbots probably is another one that most people are familiar with, the idea that um, that bot has been programmed. And we'll talk about some a couple of education examples in a bit um, where you're uh, message that you type and you'll you'll get that interact interaction from a, an actual avatar um, images and video um hopefully you've, you've had a chance to play around with those um they're great for generating you know i had to put together a course about uh, a zoo for dinosaurs recently uh, a design challenge and of course i can't find any images of that <laughs> um, but that's where um, some of these image generation tools jump in and Wemo, now I have a T-Rex that's actually in a in a zoo. Um, super, super handy. Uh, and then beyond that sort of image video generation, you've got um, sort of where we're moving to now, which is this integrated or multimodal. So I mean, ChatGPT, for instance, started out with text only. I could only type in text and only get text back. Uh, multimodal these days means if I can put in a PDF, I can put in an image, I can put in text. 
and then the integrated idea, uh, yeah, where you'll find these tools starting to be embedded throughout Google products and um, obviously Microsoft products, et cetera. So you don't have to go separately to that app or website. It's um, just there waiting for you. And now there is a few sort of issues. It's always good to go over these, even if quickly. Um, so there are restrictions we need to think about. It's been blocked in a lot of places. Um, and certainly in Australia, a lot of the states um, blocked it, especially for students. Now that's changing. We actually already have a national policy now, education policy for AI, and it's going to, a lot of unblocking will start happening from next year, which is incredibly fast if you know education systems. But um, yeah, there are other restrictions around age. I'm you know, constantly having to check if I'm looking at tools. Are they restricted to 13-year-olds, 17-year-olds, um, that sort of thing? Um, like a, many schools, there's just not much PD go, going on. Much hasn't been much time for professional development around these kind of things. If you talk to your IT department, it's a whole extra load for them to have to, to figure out and deal with. And then there's the whole question of student data being used to actually, you know, their inputs and outputs being used to train the AI. Um, but I, the positive around these kind of restrictions for me is that, hey, gives us time to learn to learn about it. Um, you know, yep, maybe it's a good idea to block it initially until we've had that chance to, to think through all those things. Uh, there's definitely inaccuracies that you need to be aware of. And I have fun pointing this out to students. So um, there's been a lot of limit. A lot of the tools are limited to 2021 in terms of their knowledge of the web. Now, there's plugins and et cetera. That's now changing. Uh, but you'll still find that it hallucinates. <laughs> that's the, the official word for it making stuff up. Um, so when I do some projects with students, I'll talk about a couple in a minute. Um, and we try and get it to hallucinate. It's part of our challenges to see if we can get the chat bot to tell us something that we that was incorrect. And, of course, yeah. That, so that's a bit of fun. Um, you can't always predict the content that you're going to see. I mean, if you're putting up content in front of students that's being generated live, um, yeah, there's a bit of a risk that something might come up that's inappropriate or that you don't, you know, that you don't necessarily um, even have time for where that discussion might go. Or so that's something to think about. And there's definitely biases uh, embedded in that that training data. Um, so for me, it's great to use these sort of tools as a prompt, as a starter. Um, but making students aware of those inaccuracies as well. And then, you know, there's other stuff like all technology. It'll it, The service will go down. Um, technology won't work properly on that particular day. Um, you're not, at, we're never going to win the detection battle of students using AI tools and then submitting work. Sometimes, yeah, definitely. And we're probably all getting a bit better ourselves at spotting text that's overly long and wordy. Um, it's pretty obvious um, some that's written if the students haven't done much, but if they really want to, they can pop it through a, a couple of different tools and um, and then, yeah, you can't be detected. So um, a lot of the tools and even a couple of ones I'm about to mention were free when they first came out, which is great, but, you know, they start charging for these types of things. And then the people that do a lot of the moderation on this content, um, there are definitely some issues you can look into around their conditions and pay, um, et cetera. On the positive side, can be a great topic for teaching ethics and, and looking into what goes on behind the, the scenes. Uh, okay, so I um, mentioned about design thinking, and a lot of my work with STEM punks um, is about combining, okay, sure, science, technology, engineering, and math challenges, but using the th design thinking as the framework to guide students to their, to their solution. It's a fantastic um, way to mash those two things together um so students are using their creativity and their design and art skills as well as the, the stem um so generally you know for me we have a lot uh, put up an example stem journey um, that we use and you would have whether it's a curriculum topic that you'd be working towards or it's you know a stem journey for instance of your own but this is one of my favorite ones um, so if we have an idea of what would humans need to be happy and healthy living on mars this is an example of one of our journeys that we do uh, through STEM punks. And, you know, this is where design thing is fantastic because um, I'm not saying, all right, here's a little box and you must only learn about um, growing plants on Mars. Um, now that in itself is a fascinating topic, growing, growing food on Mars. Um, it interests a certain percentage of students, but if we're talking about, oh, what do we need to be happy and healthy living on Mars? We've got that human design focus. Um, and then once we jump into design thinking, um, yeah, that empathize stage where we where we kick off, where we explore, okay, what's what's this world going to be like? So for us at Stem Punks, that would mean, all right, if we're talking about living on Mars and being in space, living and working in space, 
um, we want to spend some time just exploring what that's what that's like before we jump in to look at the problem itself. Um, so the Hello History app is is one that I use, and it basically lets you talk to a historical character. Um, so the chatbots have been trained on the information and data about different historical characters' lives. And you can also use, um, there's another website called character.ai, which it's just for mainly, I guess, more for fictional characters, characters from books, movies, but also historical characters. Um, yeah. So that's another site you can use, whereas Hello History is just an app. But basically what it allows you to do, and we use it for Neil Armstrong. So we want to learn about what's it like being in space. Um, we'll, we'll chat. So students will give me the questions. Um, now, this is kind of the model that I'm going to be talking about today is just if you're just getting started with AI with students, um, the idea of students setting up accounts, loading, you know, get themselves using these AI tools may not work in your school environment. Um, but the idea of, oh, well, I'm teaching this particular lesson. We're doing the introduction. I'm just going to plug in my phone with the app. We pop up the Neil Armstrong on the screen and let's hear some questions. I'll type them in and we'll, then we can all discuss together what the results is. So we're still using that AI. We're still, AI, we're still educating the students about chatbots and the limitations, but it's in that kind of, I guess, safe little easy to use environment. Um, so yeah, we had some great, great um, fun chatting with Neil Armstrong and the students have managed to get him to make some mistakes. So the most agrarious one was him telling us at one point that um, so he's saying, um, yeah, so um, the context is the moon has two weeks of, of light and then two weeks of darkness. Um, but we managed again to say that a, a day on the moon, the light and the dark only lasted 24 hours. Um, so you can have those kind of successes where you're like, ah, okay, we've managed to bust, uh, bust the AI. But at the same time, um, there's a lot of positive, interesting stuff that they learn from that interaction that helps us kick off, for instance, if space and Mars is our intro. Let's look at a whole bunch of other tools here because there's a bit of a journey. As I said, if we start with that sort of Hello History type app, um, also in that early exploring empathize stage, there's a tool um, called Co uh, Byte um, from an uh, education website called an organization called Codebreaker. Um, and Byte is kind of like ChatGPT, but for students because it's free. Um, it doesn't record any student information. There's no registering. It doesn't actually record anything from your chat as well. So it ticks a lot of the um, student student data and safety um, boxes really, really well. So if student, you know, if you need students to experience a little bit about what sort of a chat GPT type tool is, and as I said, at this early stage, they might just be exploring a topic. You could just ask questions about, you know, what, what's been explored on Mars already and let Byte, you know, feed, feed that back to you. Summarize.tech is... Uh, another great site which will just take articles or take websites and summarize them down for students really quickly just to kick off that uh, that early understanding. Um, and then from there, once you get to the define stage, um, all right, well, let's actually nut out what the problem is um, for your team or, you know, for yourself. Well, Byte, again, is really great for that, to help you with that. Once you get to the brainstorming and ideate stage, you know, sometimes I'll use tools like ChatGPT just for, uh, what would, um, you know, if if this is my problem, uh, what are some potential solutions? Um, and so, and you could use Byte for this as well. It'll you know get get your chat tool to pop up, you know, three or four or five whatever ideas that you can then refine and pick the best one from and pick them apart. Uh, Koala.com is great. It's uh, more of a story writing um, tool for younger years, but a great example to look at again of. Now you put in a few little a few little elements um, and then let it generate an initial story. So this is that brainstorming stage to kick things off. Um, students, of course, would then take that and make it make it their own. Um, you'd move on to the prototyping stage, um, and at this stage, um, Scribble Diffusion. If the students had done a sketch, a drawing, um, then you can use something like Scribble Diffusion to turn that into a more an advanced actual sketch. So you can take their basic sketch. Uh, and create a, a much more detailed image um, from it. Canva, which I'm, I'm sure many many people use at that prototyping stage. Let's take all our ideas and now make um, a great presentation. Um, if that's the point of the of the project. Now, Blockade Labs. Uh, I'll just really quickly. I think I had that one loaded. Uh, Blockade Labs is another image generation tool, but in 360 degrees. 
Um, so like a lot of these, it's got a little prompt that you can you can pop in what you what you actually want to type in. Uh, and then you'll get this kind of, it's a 360 image. Um, so it's just a much wider canvas. You know, a lot of these type of generative tools will give you a square image. Um, so Blockade Labs is great for that. Um, and yeah, maybe you're wanting them to, okay, they're designing whatever it is. A future city, for instance, is one that, one that we use a bit. Um, they can practice their prompting to get the type of future city that they want as this nice big wide image. And of course, because it's a 360 degree image, you can then put that inside of other tools. So CoSpaces EDU is a great um, virtual virtual reality type tool, but there are others as well. So you could then make a virtual tour, you know, 360 degree type tool with that. Um, you're going to want students to evaluate um, as well. Now they you can use again Byte or Chat GPT for that kind of evaluation. Um, if they're doing more business type type projects, validatorai.com is specifically going to tell them success in terms of you know product and uh, business plans, um, that kind of thing. So you can see that that kind of progression. Um, so just to just to recap, the kind of focus I guess I'm having is these kind of tools that actually on a very limited basis could just be me at the front of, pl of the classroom showing this to everyone and we do it together almost almost type thing. Um, these most of these tools would still work really well in that. Now, maybe you're fortunate and you're in a, an environment where you're able to give students access to these tools themselves. Yeah, well, then, of course, yeah, definitely go go to that level. If you're interested more in, well, how can AI help me do my planning and marking, et cetera, um, down the bottom left here, that's where I put the magicschool.ai. Um, now, there's a whole lot of these kind of, you know, AI for teachers type tools and websites. That's Magic School AI is probably the best one that I know of in terms of easy, easy and fast to use, but also has a comprehensive enough number of templates and services that are actually built like specifically for teachers. Um, yeah. And then yeah, I just want to finish off by talking about the SAMR model as well now as sort of a next step beyond even design thinking for where we would plug in these tools. So if you're familiar with the SAMR model, um, this might be really useful for you as well. And SAMR is all about, okay, well, what's the journey that we go through? Some kind of new technology comes along. In my early days, it was interactive whiteboards. Um, and you can map today, it'll be these AI tools against these stages for where do we start and then give us some goals of, of where we would like to move towards. So substitution, you always start off with, I was already doing this. I'm going to use the new technology and basically do the same thing. Um, there might be a slight little advantage, but it's very, very similar, you know, and instead of handwriting my notes, I'm going to type them if I just got a laptop. Um, yeah, it's a slight advantage, um, but as we move through, well, augmentation, um, okay, well, this is where now I've got, yeah, I've got access to spell check and thesaurus, and, you know, so actually it is much better than just my handwritten notes by the time you start using some of some of the augmenting tools that are possible from that laptop. Um, modification, well, uh, instead of just me typing my own notes, maybe now I'm going to the whole task instead of just being a note-taking task. Now it's a collaborative task. I've got all my notes. Maybe I'm using a shared Google Doc or a shared document where we're actually typing and, and working together. And that's all just part of what having a laptop provides. Um, I don't have to take advantage of it, but if I can do that collaboration, then I'm up to modification. And then redefinition, an example might be, oh, now we're not just typing notes from somebody else. We're going to take all our collaborative combined notes and publish our own resource, our own book or presentation. So that's a quick look at how SEMA works. Uh, in terms of something like the chatbots, like Hello History or the character.ai, uh, initially you might just type in your question to Neil Armstrong rather than typing it into a Google search. Um, not too much of a difference. That's still sort of substitution level. Uh, augmentation, what it might look like using these tools with, as far as SEMA model might mean that, oh, actually, I've got all my previous chats that have been saved. I can go back through them and copy and paste them. Uh, there's a lot more I can do than just a, what I could have done in a Google search. Uh, the modification, this is the one I was talking about before. I love getting the students to compare responses and try and actually find errors. Um, so it's not just that initial ask, ask a simple question task anymore. The task has been modified. Um, where it's really testing out the student's knowledge of this topic now because they need, they need that knowledge to even be able to find the errors. And then redefinition, you have character AI. Again, if your students are allowed to have access to it and if that seems appropriate, they can make their own chatbots from that point, you know, pick their own historical character or fictional character, um, set up the parameters, et cetera, and then publish that for other students to try. 
Uh, another example, come back to that blockade labs and the 360 degree, if we were using that AI tool, you know, with the SEMAR model, again, you might start with just a basic prompt, type one thing in future city, boom, download that image and, and you're done. That's kind of the same as searching Google for a future city image and grabbing that. Um, but of course, augmenting, yeah, you can actually go back and modify and create multiple images that refine those until you get one that's much, much closer to uh, what what you need. Like for instance, when I'm doing cities on Mars, um, it's very hard to get rid of the blue skies. You know, Mars will obviously have more orange type skies, but you know, if I keep changing my prompts, etc., eventually I'll get that. So that's the augmenting. Uh, again, modification students comparing responses. I don't want to have five moons in the sky, for instance, if I'm doing Mars, there's only two, for instance. So getting students to know, have enough knowledge to pick up those. And then, yeah, like redefinition, the whole task is redefined to the point where they take those and they put them into something else like co-spaces and make their own um, virtual reality uh, type setup. Um, yeah, so that brings me, I guess, to the end of what I wanted to share with you all. Um, I might even on my screen go back to our little list of topics here. You might want to scroll screenshot Frager up but there will be of course a replay of the video available as well if you you don't have to madly write everything down um but yeah hopefully that was an interesting as a story about where we've come from and then where that that fits into practical uh ideas for now thanks for all the little reactions that's a nice having that as a newer thing uh in the zoom um but it's time for me to check the chat as well and how's that been going Janelle Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the Q&A or questions in the chat, just some good yeah, feedback. Very good. So if there was something you wanted to ask more about, or it'd be actually be fascinating for me. I mean, I'm on the other side of the world for starters. <laughs> it'd be fascinating for me if you had any other tools that might fit really well with um, different areas of design thinking or just tools that, that you've already tried out and that you've got comments on their effectiveness or some, any of the issues. That'd be great to discuss as well. Yeah, so I'm going to switch back to Zoom. Ah, so, uh, Julian, just reading what you were saying, uh, the SAMA model. <laughs> yeah, so 2016, look, SAMA has been around for a really long time, Dr. Putin Dera. Um, is the author um, who, yeah, came up with the SAMA model and has done a lot of research over many years. Um, yeah, works still still for me works really well in that sense of, oh, what's the journey you can go on? You get a new tech, um, you're always going to start at substitution. It doesn't matter what you've done before. Um, me personally, me, you know, I, I'll, whatever I do, I'm like, get a new tool um, and you're going to start off with that substitution level. You start with what you know, um, and that's fine. And, you know, I had, as I said, very early days, the interactive whiteboards, if anyone remembers, you know, those were kind of the the, the big thing that was going to revolutionize uh, education. And, um, you know, we had, we I actually had one teacher in my school who couldn't wait. And she spent about $4,000 on herself on, get, on buying one and getting it installed in her classroom. Um, after about six months, all she was doing was using the projector, really just putting up notes on it. Um, and that's the substitution level. Um, and if she had stayed there forever, you would have said bad investment like that is not a good use of your own funds. I mean, it probably never was, you know, but anyway, she was she was keen. But, you know, a bit later, then she got in, you know, students using the interactivity and a bunch of the other, you know, she started going through those augmenting modification, et cetera, stages. So all of us go on a journey when we get these new these new tech and AI is no different. It's completely fine just to start off at that very, very basic level. Um, as I always say, the important thing is that you go on a journey though. You don't just stick stick there. So um, anyway, so, so yeah, thanks, Julie. I'm glad that Sam struck a, struck a chord of memory there. Um, but yeah, your understanding, and this is what Julian is saying as well, your understanding of the model changes too as you start to use it. Uh, and Hua Xiong, thank you for your your comment, the creativity. Hopefully, you, there's a few cool tools that you can try out. <laughs> oh yeah, Julian, yep. definitely. Yeah, definitely. Back back to that early beginner basic level with the, with these tools. That's fine. Jonathan, we actually have a question in the Q and A. Um, question is: So my school did train us on Magic School AI. My question is: If the students use it too and correct their work on it, is it cheating? 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, the main use I've seen at magicschool.io is for teachers to use that to generate, whether it's generating rubrics, you know, planning, et cetera, or for, for doing the grading, not for students. It's not necessarily set up as a, a tool for students. Um, of course, students will be out there using, whether it's just chat GPT or um, Bing chat, um, whatever it is, they will be out there using that. So that's where the idea of, ch- of cheating comes in. Um, and the best responses I've seen that is schools and even universities um, who actually are proactive. So they they know that everyone's going to be using it. So they start talking about it, training students and um, some some that will allow students to use it as long as they say that, say that they did. So it might be that students create um, their first draft using those tools and everybody knows that, that's fine. But then after that, they switch to just editing it and um, their own their own skills, I guess. Hmm. So that's one way to think about that. Yeah, good, good. Thank you. Wonderful. It looks like I don't think we have any more questions for now, but we can always come back to any if we do have Fantastic. them. Yeah. Um, that was great. I learned so much. I really appreciated the timeline and kind of taking a look back at history. Mm. I think that, you know, how we progress as a society it's a great reminder of how important it is to you know as we continue to adapt and um, mm-hmm. navigate ai so um as we mentioned at the beginning we will have a recording of this you're able to um, we'll have all the links to join the adaptability initiative um schedule time for the grant um apply or not apply but um get that professional learning certificate for attending today And we also have some more webinars coming up, like I mentioned at the beginning. Next week, we've got Amanda Bickerstaff, who is co-founder and CEO of AI for Education. And then next week, we'll also have Alfonso Mendoza of My EdTech Life sharing the simplicity of using AI. So exciting things to come. Um, What I'm going to do now is share um, about our software, Reflectivity, show you a little bit about how that works and how it can be used to support adapting to um, the use of AI tools and all the other things educators are working on. Full screen. All right, so first logging in, you're looking at an inspiration page here, and this is sharing Um, a variety of different skills that your colleagues are working on. One of the best ways to learn about new ideas and learn whatever others are doing and get ideas for what you want to work on is, you know, from your colleagues or just talking to others. So this displays that all here for you and it categorizes them into different topic areas. So of course, topic of the night for us tonight is AI. And um, Jonathan was sharing a lot about AI tools for STEM. So that uh, square here is something that I'm interested in continuing to work on and bring into my practice in my classroom. So I can click that topic and I'm going to join a learning community of my colleagues that are also working on this skill or this idea of AI tools for STEM. So you can see everyone else here. And my space for my work is right in the center. And what it's going to walk me through is a series of steps to help me structure my reflection and my growth and my progress and my learning on using AI tools for STEM. So first part of that reflective process is thinking about future me and where I would like to be in the future with this. So I might say that I want to be informed in about a month. And the first small step that I'm going to take towards being informed is to read an article. So I'm going to take some time, go find that article, and that's how I'm going to progress my learning. The idea is that I'll be able to come back and update my work and reflect on what I did. I'll come back to check in. Reflectivity will send you a little reminder if you um, to come back in about seven days if you haven't um, come back already. And now I can update how my work is going since I read that article. 
that left me feeling really motivated. And what I'm able to do next is record my reflection about that process. So you can see I did, I searched for an article. This is what I read. I'm able to reflect on what I realized. There's an option to add a video. I could do a verbal reflection talking out loud, or you can also do a recording of maybe something you tried in your classroom. And that's what that check-in process looks like, and it will continue to bring me through these next steps. So I'm continuing to update my learning and change um, and reflect. And all of those steps are, um, you're able to be collaborative with them. You're able to bring in others that are also working on this to really share ideas and learn from others so you can all grow together. So I would be able to share what I reflected and what I did with the learning community that's also working on using AI tools for STEM. And then you can participate in conversation. You can ask questions, ask for advice or share ideas to each other in this discussion area here. So we have our QR code here to learn more about the initiative, and I'm sure we've got some links in the chat. Thank you, Vince, so much. And we will be here for any other questions that you have um, about the initiative or any other questions for Jonathan, of course, but we do want to thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to see some of you are returning or coming back. That's awesome. Um, so thank you everyone for joining and Jonathan, thank you so much for presenting tonight. It was great. Thanks, Alan. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. Have a great rest of your day, evening, morning, afternoon. <laughs>